Hello Eastwood, it is so good to be with you. I am preaching today, looking forward to our grief groups, which will start in September. Please be on the lookout for more announcements about that. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon was falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. This psalm is gorgeous and evocative. It is abundant and glorious. It is a song of ascent, a song of praise sung as worshipers climbed to the high places where the altars were. It is a song of unity and hope. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. I mean, just beautiful. Some days it would bring out the best in me, the sensuousness, the extravagance of God's love. And some days, well, my Dana Carvey church lady comes out. Well, isn't that special? Maybe that is where you are today too. My topic today is grief in advance of the grief groups that are coming up here at Eastwood. And God, in her infinite humor, put this psalm about the goodness and pleasantness of unity in the lectionary. Well, as with the life of faith, there is more here than meets the eye. This is a song of unity and ascent, written after King David takes the throne, uniting the kingdoms after victory. And these images oozing with vitality are important. We have the oil running down the beard of Aaron, which is an image of anointing and ordination and the image of, the Mount, Her of Mount Hermon, which rises above the upper Jordan Valley. It is often snow-capped. The melting snow or dew flowed down into the valley. It fed the Jordan River and reached as far as the oasis of Jericho. In an arid country where rain was scarce and rivers dry up and people depend on water, this water is precious. These precious images this abundance rolling down is special and holy. It is also messy and dynamic. This hymn is about unity. Unity is precious and sacred. Unity of humans across difference, unity in community, unity within our souls and ourselves. We know right now, distant and isolated, a church without a pastor, a country hungering for leadership, a humanity cowering and afraid and desperate for human contact and presence. We know just how precious unity and being together are. And yet here are the images we get. Beautiful, yes, oil and water, but wild also and dynamic and messy. These images tell us that unity and worship, preciousness and the holy are not stagnant. It's not, I'm okay. It's not the frozen compartmentalized smile and nod and make a polite joke. It's not the Zoom handshake. It's not the dog, the dog meme where we just sit and say everything is fine while the flames burn around us. This is where grief comes in and rears its change-making head. This is where grief is allowed. We are lonely and our hearts are aching. We are grieving. Often in our society and in our churches as well, we are taught to deal with grief in two ways. To reason with it or to hide it away. To say, Everything happens for a reason or just to zip it up, stuff it down and fight it back with everything we have to freeze it in place. There is another way, but it is not the way of control. 
It is one of overflowing, of surrender, of mess, of permission to not be so contained. And the church, people of faith at our best, we can make space for this. We can create community for each other in our isolation, in our anger, in our alienation, in our doubt, in our questioning, and in our hope. We can be present to the cascade that is grief. Unity. True unity is where a process where we show up alive together, where big joy and big sadness can have a place, where we can get out of our frozen I'm fines and let it thaw out. Let our souls overflow with tears and laughter and joy and pain. God can handle all of this. God calls this precious. This psalm is not a picture of perfect. Do not be fooled. It is not about control. It is about surrender, dynamism, and the way things often unfold. Rolling down, uncontainable, changing, and moving. Elizabeth Gilbert wrote an exceptionally honest take on grief after her love died. I urge you to read the entire thing, but here's part. Grief is a full body experience. It takes over your entire body. It's not a disease of the mind. It's something that impacts you on the physical level. I feel that it has a tremendous relationship to love. First of all, as they say, it's the price you pay for love. But secondly, in the moments of my life where I have fallen in love, I have had just as little power over it as I do in grief. There are certain things that happen to you as a human being that you cannot control or command, that will come to you at really inconvenient times and where you have to bow in the human humility to the fact that there's something running through you that's bigger than you. People keep asking me how I'm doing, and I'm not always sure how to answer that. It depends on the day. It depends on the minute. Right this moment, I'm okay. Yesterday, not so good. Tomorrow, we'll see. Here is what I've learned about grief, though. I've learned that grief is a force of energy that cannot be controlled or predicted. It comes and goes on its own schedule. Grief does not obey your plans or your wishes. Grief will do whatever it wants to you, whenever it wants to. In that regard, grief has a lot in common with love. The only way I can handle grief then is the same way I handle love, by not handling it, by bowing down before its power in in complete humility. When grief comes to visit me, it's like being visited by a tsunami. I am given just enough warning to say, oh my God, this is happening right now. And then I drop to the floor on my knees and I let it rock me. How do you survive the tsunami of grief? By, by, By being willing to experience it without resistance. That was beautiful, right? And true and honest. What would it be like to be honest about our grief together? To be honest that we are grieving? Yes, it will be messy. But author Anne Lamott writes, You can't get to any of these truths by sitting in a field smiling beatifically, avoiding your anger and damage and grief. Your anger and damage and grief are the way to the truth. We don't have much truth to express unless we have gone into those rooms and closets and woods and abysses that were where we were told not to go. When we have gone in and looked around for a long while, just breathing and finally taking it in, then we will be able to speak in our own voice and to stay in the present moment. And that moment is home. Control feels nice. Believe me, I love control. I have a calendar and some muscle issues in my shoulders to prove it. And it keeps me alone and isolated. It keeps me fine. So what if we got together and were honest with one another? What if we engaged with our grief? We were present to our own stuff and the stuff of others and the stuff of our community right now. 
This is what the group, this is what the grief groups hope to be. A place not to say, bless your heart to our own grief and lock it deep down, but to let it thaw out, to be present with it and for one another, and to lament, to create ritual, to learn to live with it and listen to it and perhaps befriend it or at least not resist it so much. To give us space for our grief to spill out and spill over. To learn how to sit with how we feel and work with it, not against it. To say, I feel alone. I feel afraid. I feel abandoned. I feel numb. And realize we're not the only ones. And realize that we can survive this spilling out. And realize that something else is holding us up, not just our false sense of control. Maybe we can tell the truth together, to unfreeze, to pour out, to be alone and together. Maybe this is the unity we need, we need most right now, to watch our emotions roll down like the hot mess that they are, like oil down our collars, like water rushing down the mountain, dynamic and powerful, and dare to call it holy. And to have it be a place, to have our community be a place where we together united witness that the things that connect us are sometimes vulnerable and messy. And we can still proclaim they are sacred. Over the four weeks of grief groups that start in September, we can learn tools, share our experiences together, risk vulnerability, and more importantly, practice the presence that allows us to be moved and transformed, to be blessed and drenched by the wild and holy presence of God that is found within our experiences, not frozen in some perfect psalm. We can work with our grief. We can thaw out together. We can share lament and listen to our grief. We can experience it and be bowled over by it and learn from it and yell at it and welcome it and hear the whisper of its wisdom. It can break our hearts open. It can teach us to be human. It can teach us to be community which always was a messy endeavor. We can engage with our grief. It can flow over us like oil and dew. And we can survive it together. And God willing, it can lead us closer together. Humans united by our very humanity. And that is precious. That is truly special. Thanks be to God.